Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio. Reporting from the basement of the Dairy Civic Center, this is Joshua Kahn with your news. In your traffic report, all roads from Castle Rock to Ludlow are clear. But if your commute goes through Ennsville, you might want to take an alternate route, due to the millions of sparrows covering every cracked and bloody surface, and occasionally taking flight to blot out the sun. You're listening to Dairy Public Radio. This is Dairy Public Radio. Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio, a bi-weekly Stephen King Book Club podcast. I'm one of your hosts, CM Alexander, alongside Joshua Kahn. Hello, everybody. And Benjamin Graham. Hey there, constant readers. We are on part one of The Dark Half, covering chapters 1 through 16 if you're reading along. And if you're not reading along, major spoilers ahead. Today we have Ben leading us through the discussion. I am really psyched, if I'm if I'm correct... I'm the only one that's read this book before, right? Right. That is correct. Yeah, I've I've watched the movie like every couple of years since I found out about it. I, I read this book in it had to have been pretty early in my uh King reading. So maybe sophomore year in high school, so ten plus years. But I remember loving this book and I'm really, really excited to talk to you guys about it. So for anyone that hasn't read The Dark Half, do we want to give a basic plot summary, Josh? Sure. Uh, A writer uh, has his alter ego, his pen name, outed. So instead of letting somebody blackmail him, he decides to go public with it and publicly, quote, kill the alter ego, the pen name. Complete with uh, burial and fake headstone. Fake headstone. And the pen name's not having it. That is my summary. <laughs> and uh, people joke around, like I think it's a it's a pretty hacky joke, but that Stephen King plots can get kind of um, absurd. This this one I'll give them. Uh, <laughs> what? It's, it's a fantastic book, but if you stop to think for a second, it's about a man's pseudonym be- becoming a real dude and murdering everyone. We'll Which get is to it. We'll pretty get to awesome. It. That's legit. I, I've I'm, heard of that. I'm a little on Pangborn's <laughs> side uh, myself. <laughs> sure. But before we start about the book, it's impossible to talk about this book without uh, talking about Richard Bachman, uh, CM. You've got some research? So as many of our listeners undoubtedly know, or you guys, your minds are about to be blown if you do not know this already. <laughs> Stephen King wrote under a pseudonym of Richard Bachman. This book, The Dark Half, parallels his real life experience of being outed by a fan. Mm-hmm. Having said that, I'm I'm wondering if we need to Google this fan to see if he was brutally murdered in some way. <laughs> I, I actually know. Uh, I know the what happened with this fan is Ooh. he was personally phone called by Stephen King. Ooh. And King gave him the go ahead. It's cool. Uh, you should write an article uh, about how you found out and uh, go go for it. And so he did. And uh, he is not. He never had his dick shoved his, in his own mouth. <laughs> to my knowledge. <laughs> to your to knowledge. my knowledge. <laughs> I don't know what he does in his free time. Do you think? The guy read this book and got a little <laughs> terrified, though. I, I would, certainly would be. <laughs> we should call the guy and see if we can get him on episode three for this uh, for oh, this book. Yeah, no, just call him and be like, "You good? <laughs> uh, yeah, we're just and we up. hang up. <laughs> we were <laughs> we were worried about you, man. <laughs> I have some more interesting Bachman facts. I think it's interesting the reason Bachman exists in our book. Our main character, Thaddy- Thaddeus Beaumont. Thad. Thaddy Daddy. Thank you, Which we will be calling him from now on. (laughs) Our main character, Thaddy Daddy. No, uh, I hate this. (laughs) uh, Writes under a pseudonym named George Stark because the books he writes under his own name, while critically acclaimed, don't sell well. And um, he assumes the pseudonym and is almost trance-like, writes these graphic, violent crime novels. The reason Stephen King created Richard Pockman is because at the time in the publishing industry, publishers wouldn't allow you to write more than one book a year. And Stephen King, being the prolific maniac he is, <laughs> was like, but 
but I want to write more books. I got so many books, guys. That's my Stephen King impression. Dynamite Stephen King. Stephen King is in the studio. (laughs) I want to write more books, everybody. And so he came up with the name Richard Bachman, named after the character Richard Stark, the same character that George Stark is named after. What? And also Bachman Turner Overdrive (laughs) because he was asked for a pseudonym on the spot and that was the first thing he thought of. That's amazing. That's really interesting. Yeah, that's how Richard Bachman came to be. I'm really glad that he had that impulse because if you add, what's your pen name, right? What's your pen name? Uh, (laughs) Figurine... Yoga ball. Yeah. Because those are the first things I see. Let's see. <laughs> Infinite bicycles. What? <laughs> How is that a name? <laughs> oh, no. It was the first two words on my mind. Right. Ben, I heard a different rumor about how he came to have this pseudonym. Good. And I'm wondering, oh. yeah, I'm wondering if you've heard this one. Because oh. now I, I thought you were going to say this, and I was really surprised when you said what you did. I heard that Stephen King started writing under Richard Bachman because his books were so popular and he wanted to see what would happen to his books if they would be bestsellers if he wrote under a different name. If it was because he was Stephen King and people were simply buying his books because mm. they like him as an author or if he really, you know, had it. I have heard that as well. That is interesting. And uh, I read that like he was outed before he could really find out because he was outed in 19... 19- 85, which was kind of like he'd only released a few books at the time. And uh, it, it, it would be interesting to find out, like, what if he n- had never been found out? Would Richard Bachman be as well known as he is today? Because some of the Bachman books are astounding. Uh, the yeah. Long Walk mm-hmm. is one of King's best, in my opinion. I, I think the fact that he was outed so quickly is, I would take that as a testament to the fact that, yes, he, you know, that would have been as big. Yeah. Just because the writing is still, it's more visceral, I think, mm-hmm. than what we're, we were used to from him. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I've described in earlier episodes books as angry. Bachman <laughs> books are angrier than Stephen King books, which is something because Stephen King books such as the dark half can be pretty fucking nasty. There's some graphic shit in this book. Yeah. Speaking of which, now is probably (laughs) a good time to jump in. This story starts off in the 60s, and when Thad is a little boy, he's having these headaches, and he hears the sparrows. Mm -hmm. And he goes to the doctor, and they're trying to figure out if he's epileptic or what's wrong with him. They eventually scan him, and they find a what they believe is a tumor in his brain. So through a kind of bizarre and crazy set of circumstances, which I think we should hit on in a minute because it's kind of cool. He ends up with this, you know, amazing team of people who are operating on him and they get in there and I wrote removal of tumor. Super gross. Like all in (laughs) caps. Because it's part of a nostril, fingernails, some teeth and a malformed eye. And oddly enough, the malformed eye didn't bug me. But once you start uh, talking about some teeth and fingernails, I get like the heebie jeebies, my skin crawls. Oh, that yeah. happens a lot. Mm-hmm. People have things removed and there are teeth and hair no. in them. Oh, it does. So I gross. I've seen them. <laughs> it's so gross, man. I, when we decided to read this book, like I said, I haven't read it in years. This scene, the surgery. Like, I I remember the basics of the book as I was going through it. I was like, oh, yeah, I remember this part. But the surgery is the scene from this book that stuck with me for years. He goes into surgery. They cut open his skull and a nurse looks in and it's so frightening. She runs out of the room screaming And uh, it's described, they look in, and there's an eye in the center of his brain, and his brain is pulsing in such a way that it looks like the eye is winking. Oh, it's so awesome. I I I love that Dr. Pritchard's reaction to that is like, does this thing, and he's (laughs) like, by the way, make sure that nurse is fired, and just goes about his business (laughs) like an eyeball staring back at him from a brain is no big deal. (laughs) There is one thing uh, that, to like, I was very interested in the very beginning of this because uh growing up i had like severe migraines like crippling migraines Mm -hmm. i'd have like several a week 
And so throughout my childhood, like I got put on tons of medication, uh, like to try tons of things to like cure my migraines. And so I highlighted a part in here where it's like only a few pages in. It's like page four on my Kindle. And I was already like, I'm in. Let's <laughs> let's see where this goes. Because he says he could do nothing when these headaches held him in their grip, but lie in his darkened room waiting to die. By the end of September, he hoped he would die. And by the middle of October, the pain had progressed, progressed to the point where he began to fear he would not. And Oof. I was like, that's my childhood. <laughs> Oh my god. That, that that living nightmare was my adolescence. You don't have a pseudonym, do you? <laughs> I might. Ugh. Yeah, that is not an exaggeration. With I've had migraines oh, fortunately only one like that, but I have a friend who has been hospitalized for migraines. Jesus. It is it is severe stuff. And th- that turning out that you have part of another human in your head. There's a good reason for that pain. Yeah. If as it turns I out, found out if I went in to have surgery and then came out of that surgery and they were like, "Oh yeah, we found an eye and a bunch of fingernails and shit in your head," <laughs> I would throw up forever. <laughs> <laughs> I would vomit until I was dead. Although our character, our main character at this point, does not know that that was what was in his head because that's true yeah the doctor is trying to spare him the wrath of his kind of shitbag dad who is never mentioned again Thank uh, i wrote goodness. that down. i'm very happy about that uh, one of my very first notes is glenn beaumont is a piece of shit and i hate him already yeah when he uh, asks, like here's all these things and his only question is how much is this gonna cost me yeah. i was like fuck you dude i wonder who his twinner is there are, there are a lot of dad <laughs> oh, characters it that did remind me. Uh, who did it remind me? It reminded of? me of someone from eleven twenty two sixty three. Oh shit! Yeah, mm-hmm. well, we'll get to that in <laughs> a few years. years. <laughs> um, okay, so we cut, flash forward. He survives the surgery. Uh, none the wiser that he had consumed his twin in utero, essentially. But we flash forward 20-some years to a full-grown Thad Beaumont who is a uh, semi-successful writer and also a very successful writer. (laughs) Leading into, so that was the prologue, and leading into part one of the book, Stephen King often, when he breaks up his book into parts, has quotes, uh, song lyrics, uh, literary quotes, to start off uh, and introduce the themes of the part going forward. And I found it interesting that it is a a segment of one of George Stark's books that he uses. And it is a segment of the main character of the book Machine's Way, Alexis Machine, holding a man's head and driving a paperclip through his eye. Starting something I noticed throughout the book, I don't know, there is frequent eye imagery and specifically violence towards eyes throughout the whole book that starts with George Stark's eye being pried out of Thad's head. So uh, I'll point that out as we come I, to them. Yeah, I yeah. I did not. I did not realize. That. There's Paint us a, a word number. picture, Ben. That sounds um, interesting. <laughs> so uh, at the start of part one, we see Alexis Machine. Ugh. I I really hate. I I can. I'm pretty desensitized to violence through horror movies, but I hate anything with eyes. Uh, so I may be cringing through this. Whole thing. <laughs> so there's the paperclip. At one point, uh, they're discussing the books and how in the first George Stark book, Alexis Machine dies and his mistress carves his eye out with a straight razor. There's a dream sequence. I think uh, you guys, uh, I think you'll be as excited to talk about this dream sequence as I am because dream it's terrifying. <laughs> Let's, uh, actually, that's pretty early. Let's just jump to the dream sequence. Sounds good. Uh, so Thad Beaumont is a successful writer who has just killed his much more successful pseudonym. Any, you guys want to jump in? Before we jump to that, could we talk about the photo shoot for a minute? Because it's a pretty important part. And I'm not sure how I feel about the picture of Liz holding a plate of brownies out to her husband. What did you guys think of that? 
That was a weird, the, all those staged photos they took for people, I yeah. thought was a very, I like that he referred to them as looking like drunk raccoons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, that is how goofy and ridiculous well, they it, feel doing it. Was she also barefoot and pregnant? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's a completely incongruous to, like. Who they are. Who, well, who they are, what the article is even about. Yeah. Like, how does, the, the there's a People Magazine article that Thad put out uh announcing the death of george stark uh, he was george stark all along and we we have to mention that one of those staged photos is of a fake a headstone. headstone thank you that says from 1975 to 1988 not, not a, a very, very nice, nice guy. guy which i th- I'm <laughs> like i was like all right that's an epitaph I was very, like, and when I'm first reading it, I'm like, that seems like a very weird phrasing to put on this guy's epitaph. Uh, well, once we meet George Stark, it's uh, accurate. Yeah. But With, understatement. Yeah, actually. I would definitely <laughs> say understatement. Early on in the book, Thad's worrying about this article for some reason. He just feels a sense of dread, right? And he has a nightmare. A very graphic and detailed nightmare. I actually remembered that nightmare, that dream sequence from the movie. That was one of the things that stood out to me because it was so kind of otherworldly. It is. uh, King does dream sequences very well. It's a Stephen King moment. Yeah, it's a very Stephen King moment. Um, In this dream, Thad is walking up to his own house, but it's dark and uh, desiccated, and he can feel a presence walking behind him and he knows that it's George Stark and they have this banter. He's saying, you know, this is my own house, but George Stark says, no, the guy that lives here killed his whole family. (laughs) Yeah. That when he, so he's walking through the house and everything that he's touching just sort of crumbles until he eventually gets into, is it the, the den or the living room? Yeah, when he walks in, he sees the slumped over body. Yeah, of and his he wife. Knows he doesn't have to inspect her to know that she's dead. He just there's that that feeling that he knows, mm-hmm. and he knows that if he does anything but go forward, or if he tries to turn or move, because even though he hasn't seen George behind him, he knows no matter where he goes, George is right there, uh, essentially ready to do anything ready to take him down if he doesn't do what george wants and he reaches down and he touches her and her tongue rolls out of her mouth and flops onto her skirt and her eyes pop <laughs> oh yeah i forgot that her eyes popped yeah uh it's it's disgusting it the, is super the gross disgu- the description of this entire dream. See, I just thought he meant like her eyes popped. Like they're so <laughs> like, blue. She, <laughs> had, <laughs> she had mascara. It looked really good. Good eye day. <laughs> and then her tongue fell out. <laughs> and also a thing about this dream. There's one. Uh, one uh, When he's going through the house. And, and touching things. And they, they fall apart. And they break. George is kind of making fun of him. Being like oh, you're, a, you're a real klutz. Which has been established that as a kind of a klutzo. He like bangs his knee on a table in the first chapter and it it keeps getting brought up. He's a manic (laughs) pixie girl. (laughs) Manic pixie Pixie dream dream daddy daddy. (laughs) I was hoping that anybody would forget that. (laughs) But as he's walking through the house, Thad, I think he touches a vase and it like breaks. And uh, uh, George Stark is like, you go, oh, way to go, Thad. And Thad just goes, I, I hate breaking things. <laughs> <laughs> and that, just that line drove me crazy. It's uh, the robot devil says, you can't just have your characters say what they're feeling. <laughs> that makes me feel so angry. I don't know, that, that kind of gives the, gives the dream part some credence for me. I do not say amazing, wonderful one-liners in my dreams. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's true. Uh, and it's, then he, he wakes up and he doesn't... I like that the the dream, the details escape him almost immediately, but that, that fear, that feeling hangs over him and he's just in dread. And we've all had nightmares like that, that the, they're so vivid mm-hmm. and so terrifying, but the minute you wake up, they, they start 
fading away with the details, but that feeling it leaves you with is just so much panic. Mm -hmm. And it was right around this point that I realized this is a Castle Rock book. (laughs) And I got very excited because my first book was a Castle Rock book. (laughs) Uh, Needful Things, correct? Needful Things. So, yeah, you have some spoilers for some things that are uh, (laughs) set up in this book, uh, which I really want to talk about. But first, we have a chapter in the Castle Rock Cemetery where we meet Digger Holt. Steve Holt! (laughs) <laughs> yes, I wrote the same thing. <laughs> Steve Steve Holt. That made me very happy. Uh, I set the book down and <laughs> did it when I was reading it. Uh, Stephen Digger Holt, who is the castle, one of the Castle Rock uh, maintenance men, groundskeepers, and he's walking through the cemetery when he discovers something kind of strange. A grave that looks like There is a cone-shaped indent, as though someone clawed their way out. That was unnerving. Uh, That is something that I am excited to watch the movie for, to see if we get that image. (laughs) Because there's something in this book, uh, I love this book, but there are a lot of instances of telling, not showing. People coming across stuff and being like, huh, wonder what happened here. There's a lot of phone conversations of being like, oh, we discovered this information. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to see George Stark's hand coming out of the ground and clawing his way up. But instead, we get a weird old uh main man <laughs> uh being like well this is scary i'm not going to think about it and then wandering off for now. <laughs> <laughs> this was i also highlighted one of the things that he says uh we talked about in Carrie when he uh, Stephen King writes how somebody refers to a group of people in a way that No one does. This one's more normal, but I appreciated that it just says that uh, these were people Digger regarded as the real ass aches. It's just... (laughs) It's... it's, I imagine things like that are Stephen King's, like, small town Maine uh, isms. Like, oh, I'm just a good old boy from a little town, and that... I don't know, it seems very... uh, uh, I believe at one point Norris Ridgwick is called a small town hick. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I feel like that comes from. And the the character, this character that is uh, such a minor part in this book, mm. and he calls them like calls those people real assics, and I was like, ha, that's funny. And then, as with everything in Stephen King, it progresses <laughs> to a place that just gets weird. As then he talks about the photographer that he saw there doing that, and refers to her as. A high class cunt from the city. And I was yeah. like, man, Steve Holt. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Steve Holt? <laughs> Steve Holt? Ugh. Really, really taking a shot at that lady. <laughs> so then we have Digger following the trail of footprints leading, leading out of the graveyard. And he's like, these, these strides are a man on a mission. They're not someone lost. They are someone who's heading. Someone this he wants way. to leave alone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He essentially goes, <laughs> This is freaking my shit out, and then goes home. And it isn't until later, when a dead body is found, that he goes and tells a very important character that uh, I, I want to get to, <laughs> Sheriff Alan Pangborn. Pangborn! Pangborn. <laughs> so, like you said, this is a Castle Rock book. I believe it's the third, or fourth? It's the third. Is it? I looked it up. Okay, tell us the the, the Castle Rock well, anthology. Sure. So uh, the the reason I looked it up was because he, they talk about uh, the sh- the old sheriff Bannerman mm-hmm. uh, that says he was killed by a dog, and I was like, Cujo, cool, mm-hmm. like yep. that. That's a reference I can get without right. without any additional <laughs> context. But they also talk about a serial killer who had mm-hmm. been murdering people, and I was like, all right, so uh, I have a blank spot here. What is it? And it turns out to be the Dead, the Dead Zone. Zone. Amazing book. Uh, I'm very excited to read that now. Mm -hmm. So Dead Zone, Cujo, Dark Half, and then the Sun Dog. Which is a novella novella. in the Four four Past Midnight? I think so. Question mark. (laughs) And then Needful Things. Yes. Uh, Needful Things in which Alan Pangborn is 
pretty much the main character. Right. And he he talks about Thad in Needful Things. Do you guys no. remember oh, no. that? It's been a long time since I've read Needful Things, and there were a lot of names that came up throughout the dark half that I was like, I think I know, I recognize that name from yeah. Needful Things, but... Yeah, he mentions Thad, and he he's talking about how he's an alcoholic, and his... Oh, man. Okay, sorry. Major spoilers for how Thad's life oh, turns out. I don't know. I haven't finished <laughs> oh, the book. Boy. That his uh, wife and kids left him. Aww. Which is another... Not quite, but almost parallel to Stephen King's life, because, you know, he went through that period where mm-hmm. he had that drug addiction. Although, thankfully, you know, he's still got an intact family. And then there's another book, Bag of Bones, which I, I'm not sure if it's considered part of the Castle Rock mm. books, although it, there's a big portion of it that does take place in Castle Rock. Hmm. But Mike Noonan, who's our main character in Bag of Bones, says that another huge spoiler. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thad committed suicide. Whoa! Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, man. So I what? guess since we haven't finished the book, did George kill him? And it looks sh- like suicide. Uh, nah, nah, I don't know. I don't know now. <laughs> Holy I'm, shit. Man, yeah, I didn't. I'm sorry. <laughs> man, Bear it's going to put news. a real well, This is the last episode on... of the dark half, guys. <laughs> yeah. we, uh, we pretty much got to the bottom of it. <laughs> Bummer. That uh, is, yeah, that is messed up. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so we meet Sheriff Alan Pangborn and uh, his one of his deputies, Norris Ridgwick, who... If I remember correctly, in the Dead Zone is a minor character, and it's uh, kind of a callback where uh, Norris Ridgwick is over the body of a man named Homer Gamash. And before Alan shows up, he said that he had the wherewithal to throw up well away from the crime scene. Right. That that's if I remember correctly, a running joke throughout oh. the Dead Zone <laughs> is uh, whenever a body is discovered. Norris Ridgwick throws up at any sign of violence. <laughs> and uh the old Great sheriff cop. the old the old sheriff kept yelling at him, being like, What are you doing? This is a crime scene. <laughs> Stop leaving you your DNA places. Idiot. But um, then we find out that Homer was beaten to death with his own arm. That's so yeah. sad. Luckily it's a prosthetic arm. That's still really <laughs> sad, Josh. It, I'm not I'm not saying it's not sad. But think of how much sadder it would be <laughs> if it was his good arm. That's a real uh, taking your hitting yourself to a next level. <laughs> Why are you hitting yourself to death? Why are you hitting yourself to death? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Can I add one more thing yeah. about Thad's poor, sad life that apparently is not going to end well? Even his twinner has meets a grisly end. Do you guys know who his twinner is? I do not know. Ted Milner from Secret Window. He's not the main character. He is the real estate agent who has an affair with Mort's wife and eventually marries her and then I think is brutally murdered. I've never read Secret Window. I have, but it's been years. What? What? (laughs) (laughs) How so? Ben, do you need a minute? Yeah, I do. Because I thought you were going to say it would be it would be more the main character because he's a writer with spoiler alert for Secret Window a fake like murderer essentially haunting him. I that's just what I the research that I had found huh. it, it all pointed to Ted Milner. If that is not correct, because I was surprised too. Yeah. I was like, what, well, I don't even what? remember that character. So, Guys, let's check the chart later. Yeah. We well, or. A listener could update us. Yeah. Yeah. Let us know if we're very far off base. I really need to reread uh, Secret Window, Secret (laughs) Garden now. Um, Okay. So we have found this body murdered and he goes to this woman, Mrs. Arsenault's house uh, in search of clues. So Mrs. Arsenault uh, says that she saw Homer on his way home pick someone up. Somebody that she thought was going to approach her house. Thought it was weird he was standing out in a full suit out by the the road. Uh, Homer picks him up and goes, next thing they know, they find this dead body. So they're like, okay, uh, whoever this was is somebody that uh, Homer, that maybe Homer either knew or for some reason he was able to talk him into feeling bad for him enough to give him a ride. Murdered him, took his truck. So, all right, we've got a license plate number to check now. Great. Then we go to State Trooper Warren Hamilton, 
who the has got a state trooper Warren shittiest catchphrase in the world, Hamilton. <laughs> the ask mama. This is my George from Carrie of this book. Yeah. I hate this character that appears in one chapter and then is never seen again. I hate him because he talks entirely <laughs> in Kingisms. I kept reading Mama in Carrie's voice <laughs> because I couldn't Ask help Mama. it. Ask Mama. Ask Mama. I thought he was going to die. That was a Me a too. I had hoped he me. was. Well, <laughs> I do like his... My note was uh, State Trooper Hamilton has a real problem with lobster. I sure hope that comes back. He has a number... <laughs> this guy, he, he is driving at a, a rest stop in Connecticut when he finds a truck that matches the description of, of uh, George's... Uh, Homer's. Homer's Homer, truck. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Homer's truck. And he stops, but in the process of investigating, he has three or four of the most annoying <laughs> catchphrases, uh, including, ask Mama if she believes this, which he says out loud to no one <laughs> at least three times. <laughs> Twice in the same paragraph. He begins the paragraph talking to no one, saying, ask mama if you believe this. Wow, this truck sure is bloody. Ask mama if you believe this. Like, <laughs> shut the fuck up, man. <laughs> then he talks about fucked up crawdaddies on the main license plate, yep. which, okay, you, yeah, sure. And then he keeps saying, old cops, bold cops, but no old bold cops. He says at least twice. And this is, this is the end all be all of this fucking character. I'm glad we never see him again. He says, once again, out loud, safe is safe, sorry is sorry, and that's all I know by the great Bygari. He exclaimed. <laughs> to he no said, one. <laughs> he said that out loud, and then the paragraph goes on to say, that one was one of his favorites, but not quite as much as Ask Mama if you believe this. <laughs> That's one of his favorites? <laughs> if I knew that, how is this guy a cop and not beaten to death <laughs> within a few days? I like, really thought he was going to get beaten to death at the end of that scene. I did, yeah, yeah. I heavily yeah. anticipated. This is just another example, though, of how Stephen King can spend 20 pages mm -hmm. with a character we've never met that we'll never meet again. But I am still, like, I was tense. Involved, yeah. I was tense the whole time because I was like, this... Oh man, yeah, I, this I guy's gonna to meet a grisly the, end. The book. Look behind you. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, a gift of character development to definitely. be able to create these characters. And I love it so much, even if I hate the things they exactly. say. Exactly. It's amazing that it's a one off character that is completely irrelevant to the story and could have easily just been bland cop number or whatever. That, that could have been one of the call-ins, but that was a yeah. moment that we did get this <laughs> elaborate description of. Yeah. So imagine if King had given us the elaborate descriptions of everything else. Would there have been this internal monologue going on? Yeah. I God, I wish. That's the <laughs> well, worst. And the, the truck is, is all like gross, bloody with Cigarettes, cigarette butts, and all malls. Mm -hmm. Stephen, and Stephen King's fingerprints. Uh, brand of choice. Very clear fingerprints. Everywhere. Everywhere. I was like, this is, all right, we've got our piece of evidence. We've got the piece that this brings to the table. It took us 20 pages to get there, but we got it. But now, I'm very excited to talk about Frederick Clausen's crime scene. Can we just jump straight to that? Yes. Because I freaked out. <laughs> I was so excited. <laughs> To it, hear about, and now Frederick Clausen is the person who was trying to blackmail Fatty Daddy into giving him money to not reveal his identity. And so they, you know, they jumped the gun and made sure in the article to not mention Frederick one time. They never that's right. even acknowledge him. They He makes a point to say, we'll not give him any credit for this. And he's just going to find out when he reads this article in People that we've gone ahead and done it. Mm -hmm. The crime scene... If I may. <laughs> are, are you going to take us through the the character's monologue of who, the one who finds him? Donnie. The Donnie, 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 the worst whore in the, New York. Uh, no, I don't give a shit about her because we never see her again and the character's not interesting. But again, we spend six pages right. learning her whole backstory about how what a great whore she was. So she finds 
Frederick Clausen, sitting in one of the two living room chairs he had been tied in. He was naked, his clothes in a ball under the coffee table, a bloody hole in his groin, his testicles were still there, but his dick was in his mouth. And there was blood all over the room. His tongue had been cut out and nailed to the wall, and pushpins had been driven... Uh, what is it? They've been. They were driven into his pink meat so deeply <laughs> that uh. she could only see the grinning crescent of bright yellow from which the pushpin's top was. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, he didn't nail his tongue oh, to the wall. Oh, the He used a like a thumbtack. <laughs> That's how hard do you have to push a thumbtack into a wall through a tongue? That's only one way to find out. Uh, it's a dedication, right? Gross. <laughs> it's so. Cr- Graphic. I, can, I don't know the amount of times I've tried to push pin something in and it fell out. Oh man! <laughs> like just tried a couple times. I can only imagine doing that with a tongue, and then it drops and it splats on the floor. And like ah, oh, again. <laughs> so can you guys remind me when Sheriff Pingborn comes to Thad's home to talk about Homer? Who's home? No. <laughs> I will quit. I will quit if I have to hear this one more time. <laughs> we just broke the podcast. <laughs> um, oh God, what was I even asking? Oh, wh- where in the timeline does Fred get murdered? Is is he already dead when the sheriff shows he up? Is, he is remember. dead, but they haven't they don't found know. him yet. Right. Okay. Yeah. They are going to. They they haven't gotten the call. They get. I think they get the call from Dottie. Yeah, because just, it isn't until later that day when he comes back when he asks about what was written on the wall above Frederick Clausen's body in his mm-hmm. blood. The sparrows are flying again. Which Thad, like that, before he comes back, he has yeah. written that himself in like a yeah. trance state. We're well, jumping okay, all yeah, we're jumping all over <laughs> the place. Um, we cut from Clausen's murder. Thad is at home writing, and his wife Liz is going to answer the door, and she's being very careful because apparently weirdos have started kind of drifting by the house you since mean this fans. article. Yeah, well, yes. <laughs> keep coming by the house so she comes and uh answers the door and it's alan pangborn and two state cops and they are there to accuse thad of murdering homer for good reason yeah you had said something earlier about not well about agreeing with the sheriff and i really like liz and i really like alan when we first meet him Thad, i don't know i'm not quite sure about him he's a very uh, passive character. He doesn't really do a lot in this book other than refute being a murderer and then try later try to convince uh, Alan that George Stark is real. That's like all mm-hmm. he really gets to do and have weird trances. Uh, but yeah, he's he's kind of a... Well, they describe him. He's, he's kind of cold and standoffish. Yeah. Early in the book, they describe the couple together, Thad and Liz, as not being a smiling couple. Not yeah. that they're yeah. jerks, but the, the pictures are odd because they're smiling and they're, they're not so a smiling staged. couple. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're just kind of, they're kind of neutral people. They're, they're intellectuals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's just kind of how they are described. But Thad does kind of warm up later and Mm -hmm. him and alan have very weird polite conversations this definitely not being one of them because alan is like you're a stone cold murderer because Mm -hmm. your fingerprints are on stuff your cigarettes are in the ashtray it happened where you lived where what where what your uh, summer home is where you did your photo shoot all these things are against you we came here to take you to jail you are done he is a hundred percent positive yeah and there's a part where Thad, in his in his journal, describes this meeting. He says, I, I now understand Kafka's The Trial and George Orwell's 1984 better because of this feeling of being confronted by someone who is 100% sure you're guilty of a crime you know you did not commit. Except Thad immediately is like, oh no, it couldn't have been me. I have a solid alibi. And the cops are like, oh, yeah, okay, and then leave. <laughs> so I don't think he's read the trial. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, so he has a stone-cold alibi. He threw a party on the night 
of the murder and was halfway across the state. Mm-hmm. So and there, a lot of people were there even after the, the time frame in which the murder occurred. Right. Yeah. We have a couple instances where Thad is hearing, he started hearing the chirping again, and he's, he's having these feelings, which, uh, as it turns out, are coinciding with the times where George is doing these terrible things to people. He, he hears birds, he gets the pain. It's like, as we talked about earlier, he takes one of George's pencils and writes the sparrows are flying with it uh, because he only does that. He only, mm. he only writes George with a pencil and then he, he uses, uses a, a typewriter. typewriter. So he has the pain. He writes that the sparrows are flying again with George's pencil. Later, Pangborn returns with a six pack with like a peace offering and is like, hey, my bad. It can't possibly have been you. We checked all these things out. I, I don't know what's happening, but he's, let's wrap. He's still suspicious. Right. Because he's trying to work out any kind of thing to make sense of it. Because Alan Pangborn is a a, he's a realistic man. And mm-hmm. he's he's very um, stoic, you know, kind of. and uh, He trusts his instincts, too. Yeah. And his instincts are telling him... Every, the, all the evidence is saying, it's this guy. But his instincts are saying, ah, it's not this guy. I believe yeah. him. Yeah. Leading to this very weird exchange. Yeah, it is. Pangborn working on... They have... The reason he was 100% sure of, did we cover this? The reason that he, that he was 100% sure Thad did it. The fingerprints, all of the, the cigarettes. The fingerprints are yeah. perfect exact matches. So when he comes back with beer, at one point he asks Thad, Hey, Thad, um, you wouldn't happen to have a twin brother, would you? <laughs> and Thad's response is essentially, nope, uh, Liz and my twin children are my only family. Now, here's the story of my wife's miscarriage. I, I wrote that and underlined. <laughs> That's a weird note. Yeah. Weird segue there, Thaddy Daddy. Like, oh what's God. the deal? <laughs> Um, now, it's interesting because it, it's not really, it, it's implied that the years that Thad wrote as George Stark were hard years mm-hmm. for his marriage, and just their life was, there were dark undertones, but you don't really get a sense of what really all happened. Right. But then he tells a story of this miscarriage of how they were shopping at the mall, and Liz, pregnant with twins, was pushed by some stranger down an escalator and nearly died and lost the babies. Is it the man in black? He's a <gasps> pusher. He is a pusher. Oh my God. That is... Oh uh, man. My heart. Uh, it was Jack Mort. Shit. Um, no, he lives in New York. Guys. Well, I, They didn't say where that shopping oh, t- yeah, took that's place. True. That's true. Could have been a shopping spree in New I, York. I would... And you guys don't have to agree with this, but I would excuse that that moment, that terrible mm. segue, it's for us, for the reader. Yeah, And sure. he tries to make it smooth by setting up this scene in which they're drinking beers and becoming more friendly with one another. And so uh, whether yeah, it way- works, I don't know, but I'll take it. Yeah, it is the, the just first beers, time that getting Thad... to know each other, sharing miscarriage stories. Yeah, that's <laughs> what you do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then we, the, the first time that I openly laughed at something Thad said, and I shouldn't have laughed because it's a terrible joke, and he says, because uh, uh, Pangborn says, do you read minds as well as, as write books, Mr. Beaumont? And he says, read minds, write books, but honey, I don't do windows. And they all laugh. And he's like, oh, we're friends. Fatty daddy <laughs> jokes. Oh, ah, every, there it have is. to be like every. There yes, it, it is. is. That's his name. That's... CM. Sorry. His birth <laughs> name, Thaddeus Daddalus. <laughs> I hate you guys. My mistake. <laughs> We can we can keep doing this podcast, but friendship over. <laughs> oh man! So, um, I, I have a note here that there's a distinct style change I feel between chapters that are following Stark and the chapters following Thad. Interestingly, in my uh, Bachman notes, I found out that this book was originally, he uh, planned on releasing it as co-written with Richard Bachman. Oh, that would have been cool. As, as though they worked on it together, even though by this time Bachman was quote-unquote dead. I thought this book was written 
as a response to the outing. Was it written before that? Uh, no, it was, uh, he was outed, God, where are my notes? Sorry. <laughs> he was uh, outed in 1980, what did I say? 85? And this book takes place in 1988. Okay. So it was a few years after. Okay. But uh, it's not like he hasn't also done projects with Bachman since, right. The Regulators yeah. <laughs> and uh, Desperation. Right. Anyway, I, I, I felt like there was a distinct style difference the thad uh chapters were more pro- police procedural almost mm-hmm. the scenes with him and alan pangborn and then the chapters with stark are full out actions uh, they're more scenes. visceral for yeah sure. yeah and i just thought that was intense action scenes yeah oh can we can we talk about uh the ex-wife publishers Miriam? Death. Miriam? yeah oh the that whole chapter that's just a montage of death that is <laughs> was the best chapter in the book in I, my opinion i don't know about you guys maybe i was desperately wanted her to not die i was like maybe he's not gonna kill her <laughs> there's there's she's no gonna way get away, right? that's true she she had me at hawkable lock uh, she's describing it. Somebody could have stolen my walk and taken the money out of it and then sold it. It's a pretty hawkable walk. And I was like, ah, <laughs> classic Miriam. <laughs> uh, but you know that she is going to die. Yeah. Because there is a, uh, a short sequence where Thad goes to work and has, uh, after having a CAT scan, has uh, another trance in which he scrawls. Uh, and we see the scroll on the page, which I thought was really yeah, a cool, that was cool layout. We see the scroll where he has cis terminate uh, sparrows are flying, uh, razor, just all these random words written over and over again. And he's like, this doesn't mean anything. And he rips it up and throws it away. And then the next chapter is titled Sis. Yeah. And it's about mm-hmm. Miriam. Well, he burns the paper, doesn't yeah. he? he yeah, he throws it in the incinerator. Yeah. incinerator. Yeah. yeah, actually, Ben, you know how I knew that Miriam was going to die? Because when he's got her held captive after breaking her face on a door, which was insane, it says that he had the, an edge of a smile showed on the blonde man's lips. It didn't show any place else, just on his (laughs) lips. Because it didn't reach, what, Ben? Her eyes. Ah! That's it! (laughs) We were talking before we recorded. Uh, that there were there were many kingisms that I, I hadn't written down. And I was like, they're in there somewhere. I, I knew I'd found it. <laughs> but yeah, so he her door is ajar. She reaches to like because she's not going to go in because somebody could be in there. She goes to reach for it to pull it closed, but instead a hand shoots out, slams her into the door, and swings her into an apartment and holds her hostage to make her call Thad. <sighs> Mm-hmm. just throws her on the couch and her like face like it broke her cheek and so her face is starting to swell gives him the phone fo- gives her the phone and is like make this call it is terrifying because he's holding the razor to her and it is just it's so creepy it's such a tense scene george stark is a awesome villain he is so scary just because he's just this unstoppable dude earlier in the book thad is talking about crime novels all the old crime novels that inspired him to write the george stark books and he says that most of them the main characters are more killer robot than person yeah and that's the feeling you get when during the stark chapters that this guy is just this unstoppable murder machine and it's it's frightening and everything he does is so smooth and calculated Mm -hmm. uh completely mirror uh mirroring thad's uncoordination mm -hmm. he's klutzy unlike him uh stark is graceful and fluid and really fucking scary yes so fucking terrifying uh she calls freaks out thad and then just before she can say anything else, after she said that, uh, I think she she even calls him a very bad man, and then mm. he slices the phone cord and then kills her, cuts her and throat. leaves, and then Thad freaks out because he realizes he he'd written down all these things, calls Pengborn, and somehow cool as fuck through that whole <laughs> conversation. He oh. is just real chill. It's like Pengborn, um, what you doing? You got um just 
a, a, a little thing, nothing major, you need to call NYPD <laughs> and get someone to this house. And then he gives the description. And I like that he he is he's like, I you can't I don't have time for you to ask me questions. Here's what's up. There are cops are gonna be looking for a man who looks like this. He's blonde, he's huge. He gives this, him so much detail so though that much. he this doesn't This is need a to... note that I have. This brings back the eye imagery. What he says when he is going to tell Pangborn the description of Stark, he does not have a picture of Stark. He's not real, obviously. Right. But he has this this idea of Stark. And he says, quote, Thad closed the eyes God had put in his face and opened the one God had put in his mind. So cool. <laughs> the eye which persisted in seeing even the things he didn't want to look at. Uh, and then he says something along the lines of, uh, you know, when they, they look at Thad, they just see a tall, gangly, middle-aged dude. But, quote, what they couldn't see was that third eye inside his head. Ah! That eye glowing in the dark half of him. And if they could, many of them would steal it, even if it meant gouging it right out of his flesh with a dull knife. I missed that. Yeah. I was so, like, into the moment. I completely missed that. Yeah. Oh, uh, God, that's crazy. That's prob- well, another one of my favorite parts of the book, because I was like, I had been looking out for all this eye, you know, imagery. And mm-hmm. when he said that, and it, it has the name of the book in it. It mm-hmm. does. It yeah. sure always, does. Always Call love back. that. Yeah. So, yeah. And he gives the description of of Stark to, uh, to Pangborn. Yeah. And that's when they're like, we need to get, every- make sure... All these people are safe because, like, this is who he's going after. Make sure everyone's covered. And so they start rallying the the police to go to all these places. But they sure don't get to Michael Donaldson in time. No. Oh, Michael. That scene with Michael Donaldson is great. Michael Donaldson is the writer of the, the People magazine article that exposed Richard Stark. And... George. Right. <laughs> Richard Stark is the character George Stark. Right. Anyway, I wrote it as R- Richard Stark in my notes. We, uh, this call isn't back. a DPR episode if Ben doesn't, doesn't call a character doesn't butcher by someone's name. name. <laughs> uh, so Michael Donaldson is the writer. George Stark just, like, as he's going into his apartment, comes around the corner and just goes at this guy slashing at his eyes he ducks out of the way though and he slashes him across the forehead and blood it describes the flap of skin his skin, his skin flops uh, down did you guys over his think maybe he was gonna get away i thought i, I thought maybe the way he was going like yeah. and that he, he was like that he was preternaturally like and knew what he was going for and so mm-hmm. he could dodge and he was making his way downtown walking fast faces passing him homebound Sorry. Why? <laughs> just why? I don't know. It just came out. But he, um, yeah, he, he was escaping and he was dodging. And I was like, maybe the, the cops might get there in time. Mm-hmm. And they're no. so close. So the cops close. are so, so close. So close. He hides behind a plant. George that, Stark that, hides behind a plant. Which is hilarious <laughs> because when, when Fatty Daddy gives his oh description, he describes <laughs> George Stark as, quote, very wide, which I think is just a real funny way of describing a person. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, he hides. Well, that once again describes George Stark is preternaturally graceful. He and he's just calm sneaks and out. Collected. Well, in uh, in when he killed George Clausen, it's implied when Dottie Eberhardt finds George Clausen's body, she's staring at the body and she hears the door close behind her. Mm -hmm. And she thinks, oh my God, the killer was standing behind the door and he got out of the apartment without Mm -hmm. her noticing. So yeah, George Stark is a very wide cat. What do you guys think this book would be like if George was our main character writing about how he clawed his way from the grave after Thad had killed him Um, getting his vengeance? (laughs) I like this book. I want to read that book. Yeah, I'd love, love to read that book. Can we uh, go through just, uh, just hit yeah, these real murders quick. real quick? So he it's chop, he slices Frederick or uh, Michael Donaldson up. Yeah. Then we have Phyllis, who is already under police protection, who's the photographer, the photographer. who took the dumb pictures that right. That, uh, she made the paper mache tombstone. Yeah. And he gets the jump on the cops by pretending to be a blind man, who, which means he presumably beat up a blind man. And covered in blood. Like and, a oh, blind yeah, man, the coat's a blind covered man in blood. 
Yeah. Can yeah. I know how hilarious that the cops are so expendable? They are literally referred to as cop number one and cop number two. <laughs> like <laughs> immediately, we were like, "This won't end well no, for these." Actually, guys. they were, and then they became cop extremely and uh, cop cautious. Yeah, it was like <laughs> was their whole thing. And nope. in in a matter of seconds, he has taken them out, mm-hmm. and then gets. Uh, Miriam to come to the door by saying that uh, that they've got him and if she wants to get a picture better get out here <laughs> fast she cracks open the door bam shot right through the forehead knew where she like yeah. knew where he she was coming number. out yeah and then uh, we have then Rick Rick who is Miriam's husband ex-husband ex-husband but they might get back together <laughs> and uh, he's the the agent or the, the publisher the publisher yeah. mm-hmm. okay and uh, fucking blows him up yeah, they, they get Rick out of the apartment because he needs to go down to the station. While he is gone, George kills the guard, the the cop standing guard, rigs the apartment, the apartment to explode, then just leaves, and they don't catch it for just a, like that one. The one cop has that moment where he's like, "No," and then mm-hmm. boom, he's described as being disintegrated. Yes, like nuts. J- it was just madness. I, I also love that di- he didn't take anybody out. In the same way, necessarily, mm-hmm. but it still had the same feel of that criminal mastermind mm-hmm. and a even more so killing. Because all the other ones, you feel like, oh, he's just this big, brutal, like strong Brock Samson style, like murder machine. He's more than that. He will kill you no matter what. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that chapter was amazing. And then we go back to more long periods of. Trying to convince people of things. Right. More more Thad and Liz and Pangborn. Well, they, they even do a phone call. Um, they The cops, they install this technology that mm. will record Thad's voice and George Stark when he presumably calls him so that they can try to match those and see if right. they're the same. Another. So, okay, this is something weird that I'd like to point out. That while they're, you know, wiretapping his house, there's the moment where all of a sudden Thad is just real horny just <laughs> decides and then he's really mad that the, 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 the wiretap guys are being real cock blocks because he's like we could go upstairs and bone <sighs> they're gonna be up there tapping that phone i guess i should just leave it alone and then it's just that's gone like that moment just happens and is gone it's a real slice of life i, I was just like <laughs> it's just a really weird you've never like, just gotten randomly horny when guys are tapping your phone <laughs> writing what he knows yeah <laughs> um, i do and there's it's a, another thing where he adds this weird detail where liz uh, uh, he's talking about liz and it says liz chimed in again speaking with the composed and pleasant voice of a woman addressing a, addressing a gardening club perhaps on the subject of when to plant corn and how to tell when your tomatoes will be ready for harvesting that's a lot of description yeah. for how she said the phrase and maybe not just you <laughs> that that phrase is longer than what she said. That's got a really complicated way of looking at things is what I'm trying to he's say. He's a writer. <laughs> yeah, he's poetic. So yeah, they they um set up this tap and as soon as the tap is set, Stark calls. Yeah. Like they, as the second they are done and they're getting ready to leave and the two FBI agents have shown up. So it's Thad Liz, two mm-hmm. FBI agents, two wiretap guys. The phone call happens. And I love that the wiretap guys are like, dope, we don't got to come back. And they just run down and start checking stuff well, out. Good good news, too, because George, he's totally going to leave that alone. Yeah. He's done. He remembers was, who he really is. That was mm-hmm. genius. I did not see that coming. And the way it's written that Thad knows what everything that he mm-hmm. is going to say before Stark says it. Which uh, speaks to something I wanted to talk about. The connection between Thad and George. How strong is it? Because this is really where it it really comes to the forefront. Because Stark knows exactly when to call. Mm -hmm. Because the whole point of calling is to get his voice on this record saying, I'm not George Stark. I'm Mm -hmm. just a crazy guy. I know that now. I'm done. Bye. Yeah, I'm going to leave the cops family alone. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think Thad is... I don't think he's realized it quite yet, like to mm. the extent which it exists, which I think once we get into chapter 16, that's really going to ramp up. Yeah. In the description of when they're on the phone, the feeling of being pulled through the phone lines to someplace in the middle because 
they are talking to each other they and they connected. haven't done that yet. So when they are completely interacting, if that thing is pulling them in the middle, but there's mm-hmm. that, so there's still that two way street that's mm-hmm. connecting them because, you know, Thad's writing things down while George is doing things. We have, uh, he hears the, the sparrows mm-hmm. in his head. We have the sparrows are flying on the walls. Mm-hmm. So we know that this connection runs both ways and it's very clear that George has a much better handle on it than Thad does. Although we find out that George does not know about the sparrows when when he calls Thad back at the grocery store that to say, "I am going to." Yeah. Yeah. So the he's connection like the goes both ways. Yeah. yeah. Just just that that one detail has slipped him. I, th- I think that's the first time that George realizes that it's not a one way street. Well, and he doesn't know as much as he thinks he knows. Right. Perhaps. And it rattles him. <laughs> yeah, but I, I also thought that was a really well. We know he has a fondness for George. He has a respect for what George does. He's terrified by what George does, but he has this appreciation and this respect for George in his literary sense. The fact that he's come to life, he's fighting all of those feelings he's had about George and that that personality, because now it's doing real damage. That that phone call in the uh, the grocery store was so crazy. They and again, George knew where he was. He knew how knew to call. He knew the number to call for the grocery store. He knew that he'd be mm-hmm. there so he could have that conversation. And his demand is that you were going to write another book. We are going to write another book. Give me 30 pages or I'm going to kill your children. I'm going to kill your twins Holy in a way shit. that is unimaginably cruel. They will I only have the know. Quote, yes. They won't know what's happening. Only that they're dying in agony. But yeah. you'll know and I'll know. And that's fucking that is- Terrible. Up. And then he says, and if that doesn't get you, I will take your wife, and I mean take your wife, and then I will have my way with her. Yeah. Like I will brutally torture her, and then if that still doesn't get you, I guess that just leaves us. Yeah. At least Scary he told him what shit. he wants. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he really made his demands nice and clear. <laughs> So that's it for this episode of Dairy Public Radio. As always, thank you for listening. Join us for our next episode when we cover the rest of the book. For Benjamin Graham and Joshua Kahn, I am CM Alexander reminding you that a novelist is simply a fellow who gets paid to tell lies. The bigger the lies, the better the pay. Hey everyone, CM Alexander here. Thanks for listening to The Dark Half Part 1. This book has been a lot of fun for us so far, and we'd like to know what you think of it on our Facebook or Instagram at Dairy Public Radio or Twitter at Dairy Public. You can also send us an email at dairypublicradio at gmail.com. For our next episode, we will cover the movie adaptation of The Dark Half, and we hope you'll join us for that as well. Until next time, stay foxy, listeners.